fly the airplane first, everything else is second. And that moment when I remembered that, I snapped out of my stressed out mode and I flew that airplane and took those controls and came in and landed beautifully, climbing out of an unmodified standard air coupe airplane, not only as pilot in command of this airplane, but also as pilot in command of my life. Welcome to the NWI podcast, brought to you by the National Wellness Institute. I'm your host, Caroline Carlson, and this is the podcast for wellness professionals and enthusiasts who want to amplify the quality of their lives in all six dimensions of wellness. Don't worry about taking notes. I'll do that for you. And you can find them at nwipodcast.org. Your membership to the National Wellness Institute helps educate, promote, and support wellness in the United States and other countries around the globe. Call Sherry at NWI at 715-342-2969 or visit our website at nationalwellness.org and click on the membership tab to see all of the discounts and resources you will enjoy as a member. Jessica Cox was born without arms. The doctors do not know why she was born differently abled, but she does. Jessica has made achievements with her feet that most people only dream of. Now she shares her story with people around the world. Born in 1983 in Sierra Vista, Arizona, Jessica has learned to live her life with her feet. There were many questions at the time about whether Jessica would be able to live a normal life. However, Jessica's father has said he never shed a tear about her birth condition. He had full confidence in her potential. With the support of her parents and family, Jessica became confident in herself as an adult and continued to explore the world with her feet. As a child, Jessica studied dance in her hometown. When the first performance arrived, she asked to be put in the back row. Her dance teacher told her there was no back row. Tentatively, she took the stage with the other students and performed her routine. When she finished, the applause from the audience gave her encouragement and the confidence to continue dancing for 14 years. Jessica's parents eventually met a Taekwondo instructor named Jim Cunningham. His response when told of her birth condition was that she would be more than physically able and that only her attitude could hold her back. At the age of 14, Jessica earned her first black belt in the International Taekwondo Federation. After graduating from high school, Jessica attended the University of Arizona, where she earned a bachelor's degree in psychology. When talking about her degree, she frequently explains that psychology credits the way people think has a greater impact on their lives than a physical limitation. During college, Jessica found an ATA martial arts club and resumed training in the sport of Taekwondo. Even though Jessica already had a black belt in a different style, she had to relearn all of the color belt material. The instructors created a curriculum that would be accessible to any future armless students. Jessica then became the first armless person to earn a black belt in the ATA. Jessica's most famous accomplishment was learning how to fly. It took three states, four airplanes, two flight instructors, and a discouraging year to find the right aircraft, a 1946 415C Air Coupe airplane. She received the Guinness World Record for being the first person certified to fly an airplane with only their feet. Jessica now works as a motivational speaker. She enjoys continuing to take on new challenges, the latest of which are slacklining and rock climbing. She gives back to the global disability community. Jessica enjoys continuing to take on new challenges, the latest of which are slacklining and rock climbing. She gives back to the global disability community as the goodwill ambassador for the Nobel Prize winning NGO Handicap International. As a personal passion, she mentors children with limb differences and their parents. Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me on the show. You already have so many impressive accomplishments. What a gift to have such an intrepid spirit. You know, I feel very fortunate and blessed that I've had um, a wonderful foundation, wonderful parents who supported me and encouraged me, and a wonderful faith that helped me during the dark moments, and just opportunity that would be unbelievable to the average person, considering I've been given so many opportunities from scuba diving to flying, to martial arts, 
to everything. And that was also the case as a child growing up. My mom wanted me to be in everything from Girl Scouts to modeling to dancing to Taekwondo to everything you can imagine as an activity for a young person. Yes, it seems that you were exposed to a tremendous variety of activities and experiences and that benefits all the way around. It really does. And, and you say that people set their own limitations. How can others overcome the fears that hold them back? Well, fear is something that is something we all face. And I love to say, even if you're afraid of something, it's important just to do it. Do it anyways. Do it because you are afraid of it. And it's incredible how once you do something that you are afraid of, it gives you this boost of confidence. And it makes you face your fears uh, more often once you've done it a couple times. And I love this uh, quote by Eleanor Roosevelt. She said, identify your greatest fear and walk directly at it. And I understand why, because there's something so empowering when you're able to do something despite being afraid of doing it. That's really uplifting. Now, you're in the Guinness World Record for being the first woman to fly a plane without arms. Please tell us about how you went from being afraid to fly to becoming a pilot. You know, I have been a daredevil um, as far back as I can remember. And my greatest fear, though, as a child and as a young adult, was this fear of going up in an airplane. And I think it was related to my fear of losing contact with the ground. And I don't know why that was the case, but it was always something that I had. And so going up on commercial flights, I was just terrified. And one day, a fighter pilot asked me if I wanted to go up on a flight in a small airplane. I'd never been in a small single engine airplane my entire life. I'd never been in any kind of small plane. I'd only been on commercial flights. And I thought, well, you know what? I'm not so excited about this opportunity. And I remember my dad, who was standing right beside me when I was offered to go up on this flight, and he jumped right in and said, she would love to. So <laughs> I decided to gather up my courage, and I wanted to do this anyway. And going up on that first flight, the pilot gave me the opportunity to put my foot on the yoke, and I put my foot up on the yoke. And I made this commitment after experiencing what it was like to fly that plane. I made this commitment that I was going to become a pilot. Wow. Now, during your first solo flight, you lost audio contact with your instructor. Unable to check in as you came in for a landing, you made the decision to pull up at the last minute and make a second run, after which you succeeded in a beautiful landing. This was obviously a great call. Do you think that losing audio contact gave you the nudge to dig in and have more trust in yourself? Yes, it was the ultimate experience of independence, empowerment, and flying is a great feeling of freedom. There's a great feeling of freedom that comes with it. And that day when my instructor turned to me and said, you can take over the airplane now, which in a pilot's training, that's essentially called a solo flight. And it's the moment your instructor allows you to take over this airplane without anyone else in the plane with you. And I remember that day like it was yesterday, but he did give me one piece of instruction before I took off. He said, make sure you can hear me on the radios before you take off. And so I tested out the radios and I could hear him loud and clear. He could hear me loud and clear. We could communicate. So I took off and unexpecting something strange to happen. That's when that audio issue with my radios happened and I started to panic and I realized, you know, it something's going wrong. What do I do? I am not able to communicate with my instructor on the ground. But after stressing for a couple seconds, I remembered what he taught me. He said, fly the airplane first. Everything else is second. And that moment when I remembered that, what he taught me, I snapped out of my stressed out mode and I flew that airplane and took those controls and came in and landed beautifully climbing out of an unmodified standard air coop airplane, not only as pilot in command of this airplane, but also as pilot in command of my life. And that's why I like to share that story, because there's so many things that happen in our life that can throw us off. But it's important to remember that we are pilot in command, and we should take that accountability and that responsibility for our lives. 
Wow, that's really an exhilarating example of an analogy that can be applied throughout your life. You're right. Now, knowing about your ingenuity and your intrepid spirit, your becoming a pilot does not surprise me. The one thing I just can't fathom is your skydiving. How on earth could you jump out of a completely good airplane? <laughs> that's something that every pilot asks because pilots are the ones flying the planes. And they asked the question, why would you jump out of a perfectly good airplane? And yeah. so for me, it was a birthday wish that I had to go up and skydive for the first time. And on my birthday, my husband was nice enough to come with me. And when you're skydiving, you do this tandem for the first couple jumps. You're not doing this solo by yourself. So you have someone who is experienced with you. And I thought, what a wonderful way. I've always had this obsession with things from up high and seeing, looking down below and heights and that. I've always loved that. So going up a couple thousand feet in an airplane and jumping out is the most extreme version. And I will tell you, the free fall, which is the moment from when you jump out of the airplane to the point where the parachute opens up and you start to descend slower, well, that free fall portion of the skydive is the most incredible thrill. And for some people, it's almost like overload when you experience that because it's a sensation that you're not accustomed to. Um, but it was an incredible experience to be able to be up that high and watch as we floated down to the ground. And that was, in, that was incredible to see that. I can't even imagine that. That to me, that's unbelievable. One of your biggest achievements is that you have overcome worrying about what others think of you. How can anybody learn to do this? Well, everyone, no matter who you are, to a certain extent is concerned about how other people think about us. And naturally, for someone who is visually different from the average person, I walk into a public place and I don't have arms. So I draw a lot of attention. And as a kid and as a child growing up, it was unwanted attention. But now I've learned to use it as an opportunity to really embrace this attention that I get and to use it as an example to others that everyone's different. And I have learned to not let negativity, because naturally, if you see someone who's visually different or maybe has a disability, you may want to give them pity, which I always say, don't give me pity. But naturally, it can be a negative experience. But I've learned to not let that affect me in a negative way, but instead turn it into a positive experience where I can keep a smile on my face and I can emit joy and happiness without even saying anything. And that body language that I can demonstrate is a powerful example to others that people who are different are just as happy and have just a fulfilling life. And for me, that is a wonderful opportunity that I'm given and now embrace every opportunity that I get attention. That sounds like it's turning your learning experiences and your life situation into a real gift for other people just through meeting you. It really is a wonderful opportunity. I mean, just the other day I was at the gym where I work out and I just joined this gym. This woman came up to me and said, oh, I finally get to meet you. And I had never met this woman before. And she just came up to me and said, you know what? When I first saw you walking across the parking lot from the restaurant, I was sitting in my car and I saw you there walking with your husband. I assumed you were exercising. And seeing that you were doing that without any arms really gave me the inspiration and the push I needed to get back into the gym. And she was in the gym for, at that point, seven months when I met her. So just by merely walking across the parking lot was enough to encourage her to be considerate of her own fitness. So that was really a wonderful opportunity. Yeah, somebody saw you and they really were inspired by you right in that moment for what they needed to learn or to do in their life. Now, you've recently been married mm -hmm. and you brought several of the girls that you mentor to your wedding. Most little girls love weddings, the dresses, the flowers, the romance. You were aiming a bit higher in your vision though. How did you hope your mentees would benefit from attending your wedding? 
One of the challenges when you are born different um, with a disability or some form of difference, you start to have a challenge with self-esteem, with wondering if you'll be able to do the normal things that everyone else does. And naturally, you wonder if you will have a future love life, a future husband, if you're a girl, if you're a boy, a future wife, and will they be able to see past your difference and love you in a very healthy relationship? And then beyond that, would you be able to have a family? And that for me was a question. It was a question of would I be able to take care of children one day? And just by merely seeing a woman on the news and her story of how she lost her arms, but yet she was still a mom and she had two sons, it changed my life because it taught me that I could also one day be a mother. And I wanted to be that same inspiration and that same example to younger girls who were born without arms like me. And so I felt it was very critical to invite them to my wedding to show them that they can one day get married and they will have someone that they will love if they choose to. If they choose to be single, that's fine too. But if they choose to get married, that is very much an option and they will find someone who loves them for who they are. So that was very important for me to show that to these three little girls who came to my wedding to make that impact and that impression that my mentor did for me, teaching me that I could one day be a mom too, if I wanted to. What a beautiful gift. Now, how long have you been mentoring? I have been mentoring now since I was 19 years old. How did you get started mentoring others? I know you, you met Barbie Guerra, right? Mm -hmm. And she is your mentor. She's the one I was telling you about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How did you end up becoming a mentor yourself? I had no idea that there was a whole community of children born without limbs until I was invited to my first International Child Amputee Network conference. And I was invited to come in as a mentor because I was 19 at the time. And of course, these children that were coming into this conference that happened every summer were um, very young. Some were even toddlers. Some were young children. And, and I was given this experience. And I felt what it was like to have this impact on these children who are looking for a lot of answers, are very curious about how to live life without arms how to get dressed without arms, how to do all these things. And there was this compelling experience I had when I went to my first conference. And I knew after that first conference that I wanted to be a mentor. And I wanted to transform someone's life in a way by just telling them about my own life experiences. And so I wanted to be connected with all these children who were born without arms or who were missing arms. And I have been so blessed to be connected with so many. And now I've even started my own nonprofit for children with limb differences, children with disabilities. And it's an incredible way to give back and to do something that I'm really passionate about. I don't have to be paid to do it. It's just something that's part of what I love to do is to mentor these kids and, and encourage them to believe that they can do anything. What is the name of your nonprofit? My nonprofit's called Right Footed Foundation International. Wonderful. And we're going to have all of the show notes links on the website so that people don't have to take notes and they'll be able to go to the website. Great. Now, tell us how you came to be invited to speak at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. One of the most exciting opportunities I've had in my career as a speaker was being invited to speak at the World Economic Forum. And as a speaker, this is probably the top-notch event that you would just, I mean, just the most incredible experience as a speaker to be able to go to Switzerland to deliver a speech to this particular audience. And I was invited, I remember it was probably now three to four years ago, I was invited to go to the World Economic Forum right around Christmas time, the invitation came in, and I thought, wow, what what better than a Christmas present to go and speak at the World Economic Forum? And so in January, three to four years ago, I went to speak. And it was a wonderful experience to travel all the way out to Davos, which is 
an area outside of the capital and to be able to travel there and speak to such an elite group, it was an honor. I was very nervous. I remember being nervous trying to make sure my speech was perfect and it was received very well. It led to many invitations after that, but it was, it was a phenomenal experience that I will never forget. Wow. I, I bet that was very, very uh, exciting for you and inspiring for everyone who was able to hear you speak. Now, you've traveled to some 20 countries with your message of hope and inspiration. This is life-changing work for those you visit, but also for yourself. It's also highly emotionally demanding. Do you see yourself getting more involved in the international humanitarian arena in the future? I guess I never realized how fortunate I was to have been born in the United States with what people consider a disability. Because I never saw myself as someone with a disability or a handicap or an unfortunate situation. I was given every opportunity from going to school, to going to university, to then going to a flight school and learning how to fly a plane. And every opportunity was never, I mean, it was never kept from me. I, I, was, I could do anything I wanted to do. And it was never brought to my awareness how this is not the case for many people with disabilities in other countries around the world until I started to do some of the international trips and visit people with disabilities in, in developing nations and realize how this is not a reality for them. They're stigmatized against, they're discriminated against, some of them are abused, unfortunately. And being a person with a disability in another country, some countries have a long way to go with helping people with disabilities. And so it creates this very important advocacy that I didn't realize that I was going to step into until I started to witness and experience the reality of people with disabilities in other places around the world. And I realized that I could bring this critical message that if someone with a disability is just given an opportunity, there is no telling what they can achieve. There is no reason that we have to limit them or stigmatize against them. So it makes everything I've accomplished come together for a greater good. And so this international work that I've been able to do and been blessed to do, I hope to continue to do it because there's so many places in the world that still have a long ways to, to go with helping people with disabilities in their country. And I think that as long as that exists, those challenges with discrimination, with stigmas, I will still continue to travel the globe make sure that my story and my message is heard. Yes, that's a fantastic opportunity to share your message with others who really need to hear it. And they're very lucky to have you be in their venue and be so motivated and so emotionally generous to bring that message to them. It's a very important mission. Now, I know you've mentioned so-called disability in that you feel that you have been very fortunate and you've lived uh, a wonderfully active life. I have a question about not the physical limitations, but the possibly physiological ramifications of utilizing your legs as much as you do. I was a runner for years until my hip and my knees started to give me trouble due to overuse. And so I had to back away from that. Now I'm still active, but in other ways, an elliptical, walking, different exercises that strengthen those joints. But it brings to mind the question, as to whether you experience overuse issues with your hip joints or knees from relying on them regularly, more perhaps than the average person would. It's interesting that you brought that question up because today I have a little bit of a sore knee and it's because I have been working out a lot in a gym, doing some a little bit of weight lifting with my legs. And on top of that, I still do the daily task and everything you would do with your hands and arms, I'm doing that with my legs and feet. So they are getting basically double, they're, they're serving not only as my hands and arms, but they're also serving as my legs and feet. And so they're doing a lot more work than the average person um, would use their legs and feet. And, and because of that, I do have like today a, a sore knee that I have to be mindful of because my legs, my knees, my feet, they have to last me my whole life. And I'm only in my 30s, so I can't I cannot afford 
to jeopardize any of that. And an injury would be devastating. Unfortunately, I did have an injury at one point in 2010. And luckily, I recovered from that. But I always have to keep that in the back of my mind that I have to keep these feet and legs and knees. And I have to really treat them well because they have to last me the rest of my life. And they're not just serving me for walking or uh, jumping or doing these things, but they also serve me in order for me to be able to eat or get dressed or brush my own hair or take a shower on my own. I have to use them and they're very critical. Yes, they really are your independence in a physical movement sense. So would you say that the potential for having overuse issues is common with people with limb challenges? I, I recall your friend Tisha unarmed mentioning the possibility of hip surgery. Yes, unfortunately, overuse can um, will have to be addressed, and and we share this among the group of friends I have who are born without certain limbs and overuse of one or the other, or or even on occasion spinal challenges for when you're using your feet all the time, you're slumped over more than the average person. So it is actually very prevalent to have scoliosis which is a curvature of the spine. And yes, we talk about this. We talk about different ways of, of getting through it. And right now, I'm, I've been talking to my friend Tisha, who is only 30, but she may have to have hip surgery on her right hip. And she hasn't had it yet, but she realizes that that might set her back a, a, a little bit because our hips and knees are probably more flexible than the average person considering we're always doing these things with our feet. And so it's going to require even more physical therapy for her to get that hit back to where it was before the surgery. Yeah, that makes sense. I was touched when I heard your elaboration on your comment that if given the choice today, you would not want arms. Please share it with our listeners. When I look back at what I've been able to not only do, but the people I've been able to reach... I realize that I've been given and have been blessed with arms that may not come in flesh form, but they have had more, more reach than any of the most powerful arms and hands, more reach than the most powerful arms and hands in the world could reach. And it's incredible how my life has really taken on this positive example for many people. And not only that, but I've lived such an exciting life. I've been given so many opportunities. But reaching people in a way that if I had the arms, I wouldn't be able to reach them. That's why I always say if I was given the choice, I wouldn't want the arms because of the wonderful things I've been able to do. But not only that, but the people I've been able to reach without the arms. Wow, what an incredible message that is. Thank you for sharing that. Can you please tell our listeners how they can find out more about you, how they can watch your movie, and how to get in touch with you? Well, you can find me on my website, jessicacox.com. The documentary that was done about my life, it is a multi-award winning documentary done by Nick Spark, and it is called Right Footed. You can find that on Amazon, or you can find it through our website as well, jessicacox.com, as well as the book, which is called Disarm Your Limits. It's a self-help book that includes a lot of the stories from my life, but more importantly, the principles that help people in their own challenges. So please find me on social media as well, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, or the website, jessicacox.com. Thank you. I have to tell you, my family and I watched the movie recently and found it really inspiring. And my 11-year-old immediately took out his phone and he said, I'm going to text like Jessica. And he started to work on texting with his toes and uh, found it to be, for him, a great deal of work and gave up not too long after that because he, he was just overwhelmed. He said, she's so amazing. Well, good for him, for him willing to try something new. <laughs> he tried, but uh, it's, you know, it was a big adjustment for him just in that moment. But boy, he was determined for a while. <laughs> That's great. Jessica, thank you so much for your time today. You inspire us all at the National Wellness Institute, and I'm sure every person that you meet as well is greatly inspired and encouraged by you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing your keynote speech at the National Wellness Conference. 
and I can't wait to meet you in person. Yes, I look forward to giving you a foot five too. I use my bottom of my foot to the bottom of your foot, sole to sole. It's called a foot five, and that's how I do handshakes. Wonderful. I will be there. Okay, great. We'll see you in a couple months. Registration for the 2018 National Wellness Conference is now open. Early bird rates expire February 16th, 2018. So register today at nationalwellness.org slash NWC. Like what you hear? Please leave us a rating on iTunes and be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. We'll see you on the next episode. Be well.